So a little bit about me. My name is Peter Bellas. I started in data warehousing in the year 2000. And I started in a big financial company here with a, with a commercial bank. And we did like Inman designs. And my first job was to add two new attributes to the customer entity. And the effect was that we needed to rehistorize the customer entity because it was historized and we needed to rehistorize everything that was pointing to the customer entity. And at the end, it took about three months to add two new columns because everything was somehow connected to the customer. So I learned that the whole Inman design has a lot of advantages, but as well, maintainability was a little bit easier. Later on, I will switch to telecommunications. So we try to do more Kimball stuff. We thought it will be more agile, whatever. And it turned out very well. If we had to integrate two, maximum three of data sources into a dimension, this worked. And especially if it didn't change a lot, it was something to work. But as soon as we had more data sources and stuff started to change again, we were in trouble. So back in 2012, I came across a project where we had three months to complete a new fraud detection system in telecommunications. And the source system wasn't finished because it was still being built and we needed to be ready on the go live day because this was the date when they expect most of the fraud to happen right away. We needed to find something new. And this is when we started to try out the data vault patterns. And it worked very well, but after two weeks, we progressed so fast that we figured out that we need to automate this kind of design and that we want to work with a business-driven perspective because this is what was the most stable because the source system changed the whole time. And this was the start when we started to create the, what became later the data vault builder. So we first created a framework, then in 2015, it became a product. It has a front end now, it has many more functions. And this is what I will present you, but this is the background, how the whole thing happened. So today, the problem we are addressing is not that we don't have enough data. Usually today, even in small and medium-sized businesses, if we go in, there are four or five different data sources. There is an ERP, there's logistics data, there's a web shop that they have. They bought maybe a reseller and they need to integrate the data. They have some Excel sheets lying around. And usually when we go in, we see that this data is being used, but it's used without any connection to each other point. And sometimes it's not updated regularly. Sometimes somebody created very cool click load scripts directly into the report and they did work, but this person left and they don't know anymore what it's doing and they hope that it's still showing the right figures. And this is the kind of problem we're solving today. Bringing all the data that a company has to the consumers within the company and to external recipients. And how do we do that? In the past, uh, when I started, we used about eight to nine different tools. We used the ETL tool, we used the data modeling tool, we used something for operations, a scheduler, some deployment software. And it turned out that this works somehow, but it was very difficult to maintain. We had big data teams and everybody had some special knowledge what he was doing, but as soon as we needed to upgrade it after a year, really use some new versions of the software that was involved, it was a terrible mess. It always took a lot of testing and yeah, a lot of costs. So this is why we came up with integrating everything into one tool. And the workflow that we designed is that we start with a business model driven perspective. So our idea is that we go and if I say I, I'm still feeling involved, but today I'm not doing any consulting anymore. We are a product company, so I'm just helping partners and clients to enable them to do that. But so our clients or our implementation partners are doing that. They go to the business user and they talk to him and they ask about the business process. So we try to design these core business concepts, which can represent processes, they can represent things, they can represent places here as small blue boxes. And yes, in the data vault realm, they become hubs. And we have relations between core business concepts and they become links. But do we need to use this kind of language towards the business people? 
we can, but we don't have to. If, if they are more happy with other terms that they understand better, that's perfectly fine. You're talking like since the 1970s, probably about things, how to identify them. We have contexts and attributes that we need to store somehow and relations between them. And this is what we model with them. And the cool thing is that this usually stays stable over time. So probably a logistics company will do logistics tomorrow as well. And the point is, if they change their core business, it will change their technical systems anyway. But just because the technical system change doesn't mean that their business change at all. Now, this looks pretty familiar if you've worked with Power Designer or Irvin or any other uh, tool to design an ER yeah, diagram. It's always very similar. A little bit different perspectives maybe at what you exactly use, which kind of tools and which methodology, but you design a model. But what we did in the past is, and literally we did it really sometimes, we printed out the design, handed it over to a developer and not seeing the diagram. Oh, here on the left, this one picture. Do you see my mouse pointer? Is this okay? Jim, do you see, I'm just referring to, ah, okay. It, it will be bigger. I'm just explaining the, the basic idea. So in the past, we printed that out and handed it over to developers. But now here with the tooling that we have in real time, we convert that in the background into working code. And this means that while talking to the business user, we can show them how their data connected to the concepts that they explained us will look like, are the keys correctly, how the relations work out, are the objects related as they expect, is the granularity correct, is the cardinality correct? And so we can answer them directly questions and this is the part that we will do in the live demonstration. But that is not enough. There's a lot of supporting processes in data warehousing that we need to care, take care of. It starts with infrastructure automation. So how easy it is to start up a new instance. Maybe we are questions for people that are doing this for ages, because usually when I started, we had like a development environment test and production, maybe pre-production, maybe user acceptance testing, but it was a defined set of environments. Today, if we start developing agile, if we go into develop, uh, distributed development, it means that sometimes for every feature that we start developing, we set up a new sandbox, develop it in there and use a Git flow based process to deploy it. And this is the reason why we need to as well be very, very automated in setting up new environments as well, automated regression testing that we support. And we need to do that if we wanna be, be agile means we need to set up a new environment. We need to load the data model to test. We need to load test data. We need to get the, the results. And this needs to be all automated that we can go in the direction of CICD. And this is exactly the point of modules that we build around Okay, uh, but you see the PowerPoint slide, hopefully. Saying our USP, simple automatic complete, or do you see something different? I can okay. see um, a slide with our USP on it, that's yeah. all. That's fine, it, it's, it's okay, okay, don't worry. We, 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 okay. we, we, we get there in a second. Okay. Uh, I'm just got carried away about all the... <laughs> processes around it, good. So what we need as well is documentation. We need data lineage, especially if we talk about GDPR, where's the data coming from? We need to be able to document who is the data owner, stuff like that. We need to have operations. We need to run the data loads on a regular basis. Before maybe some people I've met, they did it on a monthly basis. I think today most people do it on a daily basis, but here sometimes we do it every few minutes, sometimes even going down the second. So this needs all to be integrated. And this is what the data vault builder approach is about. So if you look at the different modules, it starts with infrastructure. We go into visual modeling. This is the part we will look at in the live demonstration. It generates the code. The difference is that it doesn't happen only once, but over time, if like the database changes, there are new index types, there are new ways to do something better. Or somebody writes us and say, hey, there's a better way how to process data in a specific case. 
we will update as well the patterns. So this is a different approach than other tools have that say you can do everything, but you need to do all your patterns yourself. Here it's a managed approach. We deliver you all the patterns and we update them over time. And we will update as well the existing physical implementations of that is existing in your database. And it's two way. I will highlight in a second why that is so important. We have testing in there. So there are REST API to build up a new environment to run your regression test. And this is probably a part where many organizations still can improve that regression testing should be automatic, especially if you go into Agile, if you want to deploy weekly, because otherwise testing becomes a nightmare. Deployment is in there. So we have two ways of deployments. And one is a more classical approach. We call it simplified deployment, where we take two environments like development and test machines, compare them. We give you a list of objects that are different. You can select what you want to deploy and press the button. And either it writes you a script or it deploys the objects directly. For bigger corporations, we have the possibility to use a distributed development approach. This means that we use Git as our code repository. If you want to start developing, you can branch off your data model, you develop your feature in your sandbox, and you can commit the changes onto your feature branch. And this makes it really agile, like in Java development. Uh, if you get tired of doing this manually, there are REST APIs to deploy everything automatically. Operations is built in to run the jobs, to reload the data, to log everything. It's calculating what needs to be reloaded in which order based on the model, because that's quite deterministic what needs to be done. It can parallelize everything up to the level that you need, so you don't need to take care of that. But if you want, you can use an external scheduler to trigger your jobs. We can show you how to achieve high availability. What I don't have on the slide is documentation, data lineage, and data profiling. What I will show now in the demo is the modeling to code part. And we will look shortly at data profiling. We will look at operations and data lineage. What I can't show really here in this very short time is deployment and different ways. If you have questions about it still, please feel free to ask. So I skip now the marketing bits, but if you want to see how we compare with other tools, we have as well reports about that, but I will highlight here really on the technical working and, and how it, the stuff looks like. So when we will now start in the live demonstration, we will have different elements to look at. The blue boxes are the core business concepts. They translate on the database level into hubs. We have relations. They translate on database level to links. And we have the small dots, which are our satellites having context about the hubs. We have here this big colorful bubbles, Nothing to do with data vault, classical data modeling, subject areas as we call them, or sometimes uh, you will see the, this picture in the live demo. So there you can read it. It's just now to see the elements for for first bit. Uh, this bigger area, sometimes people call it today data domains. There are different terms for that, but it's just about grouping different elements into topics, because if you build up your data vault, we have clients with several hundred of core business concepts in their data vault. So you want to be able to navigate that. And the idea is that we bring business people and IT people in the beginning together. There are two reasons for that. One is to get all the knowledge that the business people have to create a better model. But the second, and I believe in the meantime, as well as important is, to involve them that they understand later what they will receive and they feel involved that they will use it. Because we have created once in, in my career, a very pretty nice data warehouse before the data vault times. And it was really delivering everything in very careful design system, but nobody used it because nobody understood what it was about because the business user weren't involved in the process of creating it. There's a question about CICD. I will take this a little bit later so I can show you in the live demo how it looks like and then maybe it becomes visual. So before we jump into the demonstration, what we will see. So we have 
the business driven model in the core. This translates into working code in real time here in the middle layer. For us, the data vault part consists of the raw vault. It can have some data lake elements like persistent staging area if you have some data feeds which are not too clean or you don't know the business keys yet. This next step, we will be looking then on the staging layer to pull in some data. There are built-in staging modules loading from JDBC sources, loading from files, loading from REST APIs, loading from Python scripts. There is a, a long list of what you can access. Then by defining the business key, we will link the stage tables to the data vault model. It will create all the necessary loads. This next step, we will select how much we want to denormalize the data because that's what we learned already from the Inman experience. Never let your people access the core. Otherwise, you're not able to refactor your stuff. Now, the business rules come on top of it. Simple SQL rules. And then you can decide if you want to output the virtual rules directly or if you want to store back the result of this business rules into the business world. Technically, it goes through the staging area, so we can do as well delta calculations and delta loads, but logically goes back here into the business world. The data vault builder is a ELT tool, so everything from the staging layer downstream is happening in your database, which can be a snowflake, it can be synapse analytics, can be SQL Server in all its variant on-prem and in the cloud. It can be XSL, Oracle, or Postgre. So what are we doing different than other tools and why is it working? In classical approaches, when I started with Power Designer or Irwin, we did the modeling in a tool against the repository. Then we defined some patterns, we pressed a button and it generated database tables, it generated load statements, it generated ETL flows based on patterns. And that worked usually for about a year, maybe two. The problem is that at some point, somebody changed the implementation because they didn't knew about the model or there was no time changing the data model or they didn't have the license for the modeling tools, stuff like that. And now when there was a disconnect, of the implementation and the model, it started more and more people started implementing the changes directly in, in the database and everything fell apart. So after I had this experience several times, we removed the repository. So when we will now model in the data vault builder demo, we will see the results in real time in your database. And it's two way. If you change something in the database, you will see it as well in the data vault builder. Demo. So creating a core business concept here in the same second, we have a hub in the database. All the metadata is attached to it as comments. So it doesn't matter if you work in the tool or on the database level, you see always the same. If it would change here, the metadata in the database, it would change as well in the model. So instead of going through the steps one by one, we will go down to seconds. And this is what we will look in the demo. We will try to find a business key for a specific entity. Now, about agility, how does Data Vault Builder fit in here? The idea is that we have the data model as main driver. If I'm developing different features represented here as cars, I can take my data model, which is version in Git, I can branch it, I can load it to a specific database, develop my feature, and then export again my model into Git. And create a pull request that my colleague can merge it. This is very, very abstract now for explaining it like this. I will show it in the demo, which the how the file looks like. And probably if you are a little bit familiar with Git, you will understand how this works. Good. So I promised to talk about a little bit about business-driven automation and why we believe it's important. If we look at our data warehouse, and time passes, the database get better and better. There are new index types, there are new data types, there are new ways to create stuff. So your physical implementation changes over time. And usually in the past, we did that manually. We wrote update scripts, we tested them, we wrote new patterns to generate the new stuff. And this is exactly what we do here. If we have a business model, based on that, we can recreate new physical implementations again and again. And we deliver you this kind of patterns over time and we deliver you the update scripts to 
increase the existing or improve the existing physical implementation. So let's jump in and let's have a look how we design here some core business concepts in the tool. So this is how the Data Vault Builder looks like. You should see now the browser-based interface. And what I have done before this meeting started or before this presentation started, I have set up a new environment. As we deliver the software's Docker containers, you can start it on your Windows desktop, you can run it on your Linux server, you can run it in the cloud. It takes a few minutes to start up. You don't need to install it. It's just starting this virtual environment. It connects to your database. And here we are. The second step I did, I already preloaded a business model. In that case, it is a business model about the flight industry. It was a ground handler that was working with us. And in fact, they explained us that the first process we want to look at is about the flights because they're servicing the flights. So we have added here the core business concept of a flight, which created the flight hub in the database. Then we have added more entities around it, which qualify a flight. So we were going slowly in the direction of a conceptual model. When we define this kind of elements, we describe them, how they are defined business-wise, we started adding relations to them. And now some people that are very familiar with data vault modeling come back and say, hey, but what's wrong with that? Because here you have directed graphs. So we are catching or registering already what the, card the expected cardinality is between the different elements. We don't need that to create a link table because there are many to many, that's fine. But if we go a step further and we want to start denormalizing stuff, it helps us to create the right driving views, to, to allow the traversal in the right direction so we don't create any fanning traps. And we figured out it makes the model much more readable because now business-wise, you know exactly what relates to what in which direction. This big colorful bubbles, just grouping of topics. Here, this small dot is a satellite. In this case, it's only a prototype satellite. So this is the level of at which we work with. So let's imagine that somebody of you says that we should add here something, some kind of entity. If somebody has a wish, please tell me, otherwise I will just add something like, I don't know, a car or a bus. Maybe they need buses to, to service the flight. And this is all the information that I need to conceptually add it to the canvas. But in the second that I have added it here, the corresponding table was created in the database. It has four columns defined by the data vault standard. It has a strict technical naming. So underscore H stands for the hash key. We have the business key, the load time, and the source. But you're completely free to call it bus or whatever kind of name you want to apply to this object. Don't worry, we are not doing this here on your production system. This happens on your integrated development environment in smaller teams or in your sandbox. Now, because I believe there are as well some technically interested people, I will switch to the database level. Don't worry, you don't have to do that. It's just for demonstration purposes. I'm using here dBeaver, nothing to do directly with the data vault builder. It's a classical database client, but I'm connected to the database behind the front end that we have. And in here, we have different schemas like the staging layer, the data vault layer, and the later layers. And in here, if we refresh, we will see this element that we just created. The metadata is attached to it. And we change here some metadata. And in a classical approach, this would be a no-go. Now we have a disconnect between the model and the implementation. But there is nothing in between the implementation and what is on the database. So I just triggered a cache refresh in the tool, you can switch back. And if I double click here on the element, we see that 
the subject area as I changed in the database changed and the comment that I changed in the database is directly here. And this makes sure that we have no disconnect anymore between the model and the implementation. So if you later on create the documentation, we know exactly what it is, that it's really what is there because if it's not in the database, it can't be in the documentation and vice versa. And the cool thing is that all this metadata is accessible for you, not only in the GUI, but we have as well a schema where you can access this kind of information directly here in the database. This means that all the metadata we're generating, you can take and transport it into your Power BI, Tableau, click reports and display directly the definition of your objects there. So you don't need to capture this information several times. And this here is really real time updated. So let's go in here and do something stupid like deleting here this element that we just created. Please don't do it. That's for demonstration purposes. If you refresh the metadata, it's gone. So it's always in sync. Good. So let's go back to the front end. First step is completed. We have created our business model. And this business model was created in like two and a half hour with the business user is much bigger than what we see here because we can double click and browse here in different directions and see how the stuff relates. But usually the idea is that I only bring to the screen the part that I need that, that I don't, I'm not overwhelmed with like 200 different concepts that I need to work with. Good, next step. We go and we stage the data. So we go more data driven. I have imported here already from, from my Git repository two source systems. One staging load was already imported, but I can add here new source connections. And there is a list of connectors that I can use. These are databases, file formats, Trina connectors to connect to NoSQL technologies through gRPC. We can connect as well to Python scripts. Now adding a new table is just selecting it. This, in this case, it's a CSV file source. So we are loading from files in a folder. It detects the columns. And now I will skip a lot of steps like delta loading, like subsetting, stuff like that, because we can add it later. This tool is built for Agile, so we can go create a basic function, a functionality, and then later on revisit it and refine it. And here you see again the advantage of directly working with the database. Now the target table in the staging area will be created, the load definition is created, and the data is loaded right away. So a few seconds later, the data will be available in your database. And this is not a one-time load. This is production-ready implementation. So let's go on to the data viewer and let's have a look on the data that we just staged. And what I like to do here is very often just to do a value distribution. Let's have a look what happened. Data is here. Oh, I took the wrong table, which is empty. So you see it's a live demonstration. So let's take the carrier in here. Let's display the value distribution. And this gives me already a quick idea. For sure, this is not magic. You can do that always. You can do your group by having counts, whatever. But here it's in the flow, so you can have a look at. You can bookmark this. If you see something special, you would see already if there are any null values in the data. So you maybe can prevent going on if the data doesn't match your expectation at all. Next step. We understand the data and now we will map. Let me hide here a little bit that we can focus on what is important. Now we want to map the stage data with our concept. So we add here a load and now we start with the business key definition. And probably you know that getting the business key right is very, very crucial because if you define the business key the wrong way, you get duplicates later and Changing the business key is probably the most costly operation in a data vault, at least in my opinion. So let's take here something like the flight number and let's take here maybe the date of when this flight is happening. And let's press the business key checker. Now it goes, the data is already staged and validates now our assumption about the business key 
and checks it against the data. It brings us back to duplicate samples, how often they appear in the data set, and we can look into the data set. And probably all, all already visually, we see here that there is an issue. So we can go now back to the business user and tell him, hey, we see there are different carrier codes for the same flight number. And he tells us, oh yeah, that makes sense because I forgot that in the data set, the flight number is not usually what we refer to as the flight number, but it's only the number part. We need to have as well the carrier in there. Good, let's check again. And here we get again problems. And now it appears that all of these duplicates are WN, which is Southwestern Airlines. So let's have a look at this. What is the issue? And we will see that in this data set, Southwestern Airlines is reusing the same flight number if they're stopping at different airports with the same flight. So let's put in as well this. And this is the kind of small reiterations that we don't go on before we tested what we are doing. Because imagine you do this like in Power Designer, you click the button, one hour later, it's on the database, you reload your data, and one half hour later, you get this feedback that you need to revert or you manually need to check your stuff. So here it's built in. I skip again here some parts like keeping data sets separately or whatever. And now this is the minimal information we need to automatically create the load into the hub to create the satellite, which is the small dot here, to create the satellite load, to create a as of now materialization from the historized data, to create tracking satellites, which we don't display here in the logical data model because they are like technical artifacts and everything is production ready. So we can take the hub and start loading data. And this is the system that I just created. So let's start loading it. And now a little bit of magic happens because it goes back to the staging area. It extends the staging table with the business key pre-calculation, the hash key pre-calculation by adding columns, changing the ETL flows, because now it plays out that everything is integrated. So let's have a look and the data is loaded. Now, the same happens here for the satellite. You can just start loading the satellite information and a few seconds later, the data is loaded there. So we're production ready to the core, to the data vault. Should we be happy? Yes, but it's not tangible output for the business user. So let's create as a last step output interface. And here I usually go more into Kimball language. So what is the grain of your interface? So we would define here is the flight. Here we can say if we want to output all the keys in the hub, this regarding from which source system they came, or if we want to create specific output rules for different source systems, maybe they have different column names. So we need to, to harmonize them differently. Maybe they have different business rules. So I usually start here with one source system. We can create more than one interface. And here we can select what the time perspective is. In the vault, we always store it as SCD type two historization. But here I can select, I want to only know the as of now perspective, the latest information about the key, or I select, I want to do the as of 10 perspective. Then it would create in the background all the pit tables and load for the pit tables, what we need. But for the time being, Let's start with the simple version. And now it offers us to output from the data model that we have and select all the elements and business keys what we want to output. Here, I started with the satellite and this, this hub. So let's add maybe here some columns randomly and store that. And in the first version, if I do SCD type one output, this is just a view because we did already our optimization for as of now output before. And this is it. This is the data that the customer will receive in the first version. Is it perfect? No, we're working agile. So yes, there will be maybe some business rules needed later, but it will be a first version that he can access. But we realized the carrier should be in here. Let's add this as well. And now we can publish that. So I'm not, not adding or modifying the business rules. I just publish it and that's it. This is the minimal implementation in the data vault builder, adding 
some business terms as concepts in the data vault section, step one. Step two, stage some data. Step three, connect it by the business key with your concept. Step four, define an interface. Two, define what the level of denormalization is, harmonize your name, and then just skip this point for the first thing and just publish it. So we can go now in, into the data viewer, access now what we have created, and maybe split this by flight date. And we will see that this is perfect test data because only seven days of data is in here. Maybe this, that you see with the zoom contrast highlighting one day. What happened in the background? Data lineage was updated. So we can figure if, uh, filter now for the information that we just created. So we have the source system, the staging table, the elements in the core. We see that the hub flight was already filled with a different source system as well. So this is shown here as well. We have then the output that is created. We have the business rule not doing anything yet and the access layer. This is one presentation of the metadata, but all of this information is always accessible to you as well on API level and on database level. So if you want to bring this kind of information into your report, create a sound key the diagram or something with it, that's fine. You have always access in real time to the metadata. So next step is operations. Can we run this kind of job? Yes. It's not that interesting yet because we have one staging table and two loads into the vault. So it will now run everything in the right order, but it would do that as well with 50, 100 or 200 elements in here. There's a built-in scheduler where we can schedule the stuff. There is a REST API, so we can as well trigger it externally. We can now generate the documentation. And now it just accesses the views on the database to give you the information here. You can export this as PDF whatever you like. Data lineage or is there as well data lineage for the business rules? Yes. Um, we are then asking after we store it, we ask the database how it's related. And this is as well visible in here in the data lineage. So like here, this business rule is accessing only this business object. But if I manually would add some links to other objects, it would be visible here as well. <clears throat> 